Um, we just want to welcome everybody for being here to the Alaska Eating Disorders Fall 2023 uh, ECHO series. My name is Jenny Loudon. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and I am one of the co-founders of the Alaska Eating Disorders Alliance. Uh, tonight's ECHO session offers a forum for um, interdisciplinary healthcare professionals to connect with eating disorder specialists and with each other. Um, so tonight is our final session of our fall series. Uh, each session has included a didactic presentation on a key eating disorder topic uh, from a subject matter expert, and it has included time for questions and answers and a case presentation from a local provider, um, and that would provide some opportunity for you to engage and learn from other professionals in the field. Uh, the series has been guided by a hub team of professionals and experts in eating disorders, um, and they have introduced themselves in the, in the chat box, and they also have hub uh, in their names, uh, in front of their names, uh, in terms of how they've identified themselves in their Zoom box, feel free to ask them questions at any time. Our series has been approved for continuing education units, and participants can claim 1.5 credit hours per session of this ECHO series. Uh, in order to claim those credits, you must um, be here for at least 90% of tonight's session and complete the evaluation form after, um, which you'll be red redirected to receive and download your continuation um, education credit um, certificate. So at the end of our session today, um, you will get that link to the evaluation. It will be provided in the chat box. And we really do want to encourage all participants to fill that out um, to tell us how we're doing and how we can improve. So before we jump into tonight's session, just a few Zoom reminders. Um, closed captions are automatically generated and they're available by pressing the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, please do take a moment to turn on your camera so that we can all get to know each other. The camera icon is on the lower left of your screen. And please do keep your mic muted during the presentations and when you're not speaking. Um, but then you feel free to unmute yourself um, by clicking on the microphone icon on the lower left if you wanna ask a question um, during that part of tonight's um, presentation. Um, also, you are welcome to private chat the session host or, or myself or anyone on our hub team if you have a question that you'd like to have shared anonymously. So it is helpful to get to know each other. So if you have not done so already, um, please do introduce yourself uh, in the chat book box, share your name, your role, your organization, where you're from. And it would be great to find out what you hope to get out of tonight's echo. Um, and please note that um, tonight, everything with tonight's presentation, the opinions of the hub team and presenters are their own and do not necessarily represent those of Akita or any of uh, Echo's sponsors. Additionally, Project Echo is not HIPAA compliant. Uh, therefore, no protected health information will be shared or displayed at any time. Thank you, for everyone, for um, following these guidelines. Finally, I want to make a brief moment to pause for a land acknowledgement. Uh, our space here is virtual, um, but our ECHO team is joining you from Anchorage. And uh, given that, we want to thank the Denina people for their stewardship of the lands, the water, the air, and all the life that sustains us within their traditional lands of the Takatnu and Cook Inlet region. Uh, we respect the Denina cultural ways and their homelands and shall strive to be good neighbors. So with that, I am going to turn things over to Akita's executive director to share a bit about the vision that is driving these sessions and the purpose of today's ECHO as well as what's on today's agenda. Let me make sure I'm off mute. Okay, perfect. Um, thanks, Jenny. Um, all right. So I'm Becca Kieran, the Executive Director of the Alaska Eating Disorders Alliance, and I'm thrilled to welcome you all this evening. The goal of this Project ECHO is to work together to grow capacity within our local healthcare system to better understand, diagnose, and treat eating disorders in Alaska. During our time together, we'll be learning through presentations and discussions, and we want to be mindful of creating a welcoming learning community. Words matter, and they are powerful. This is an open space where all voices and bodies are welcome. We encourage you to seek ways to use inclusive, non-stigmatizing language. Let me start with a broad outline of this evening's agenda. We'll begin with a presentation by, talk, by Dr. Tara Diliberto titled Improving Recovery Outcomes. Tara Diliberto is a clinical psychologist and the primary author of the book Treating Eating Disorders in Adolescents, published by New Harbinger. Dr. Diliberto currently maintains a private practice while providing education about body image and eating disorders. 
Prior to this, she created and directed New York Presbyterian Hospital's Eating Disorder Program for Adults and served on the faculty of Cornell University's Medical College. Her past leadership roles included chairperson of NYC's CBT Technology Committee and chairperson of the Academy for Eating Disorders Technology and Innovations Committee. For more information on her work, please visit www.imt-ed.com. After the presentation, Dr. Tara Deliberto will lead Q&A with our participants. Our session will conclude with a case presentation by Heather Moon. So without further hesitation, I'm just going to pass it over to Dr. Tara Deliberto to share our didactic presentation. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Let me know if that's working for you all. Yes, is that good? Okay. All right. So, um, so right. So today we're going to be talking about improving treatment outcomes in eating disorders. And I see that there are a lot of folks here from different disciplines, which is fantastic. I'm a clinical psychologist by training. So I'm going to be kind of speaking more from that perspective, but with this context in mind that you all are coming from uh, different disciplines and also probably have different uh, levels of expertise within the field of eating disorders. So um, it's going to be both broad and specific. And uh, if you have any questions, please, um, please let me know at the end. I, I'd be really interested to answer them. So I can't see the chat um, from my, <laughs> from my end here, but um, I'll just, uh, I'll just figure that out as we go. Okay, there we go. I see. So it, it just has to come in. Okay, got it. I'm all oriented. So um, today we're going to be discussing the following high level areas. Um, one, how any provider can learn how to address eating disorders in their practice. What treatments are best suited for various diagnoses and age groups. Um, how providers from different disciplines can motivate families and patients towards help seeking behaviors and some issues that impede uh, recovery and how we can move into promoting recovery. Something else that I'll address here is our own blocks to providing effective treatment as providers and how that mirrors what carers or the people who care for people who have eating disorders go through as well. So I'm going to be packing in quite a lot of information. I, um, I'm very acutely aware that so little eating disorder training happens. And so when it happens, I think of it as like really precious real estate. So I want to cram in a lot of information. So what I think would be helpful to do, it's an invitation, you know, take what you like and leave the rest here. But um, I like to just take a moment to tune inward and set the intention to uh, listen and absorb as much information as I can from you all. And maybe you can do the same for, for me as well. And, um, and really be kind of open-minded and attentive through this, because again, we're going to pack in a lot and it's really important information that could potentially be life-saving. So with that in mind, I invite you to just take a moment, focus on your breath, drop in to that mindful state. And if it feels right for you to set the intention to have an open mind, be receptive to new information, learn how to better serve underserved populations or any other intention that feels right for you. All right, let's do it. Okay, so jumping right in, selecting treatments based on diagnosis. So the way that I think of eating disorder diagnoses as a professional doesn't really map onto what is in the DSM. Um, I think of eating disorders in two basic buckets. One is the no to low insight group, and the other is the moderate to high insight group. And based on level of insight, um, you can kind of funnel people into different evidence-based treatments. Um, and there are also factors that typically, typically coincide, <laughs> excuse me, I'm getting over cough, with these two groups. Um, so for the first group, the no to low insight group, it usually requires um, this outside intervention style treatment because people don't have insight. So for instance, when people have an alcohol or drug addiction, there is this desire that the person has to keep using the substances, right? And so there can be this intervention style work that is really effective. It's the same for eating disorders. So typically when a person has 
no to low insight typically, but this is this is a generalization. The person can can have a body that is in the underweight category for their particular bodies. And um, with low weight um, can come some cerebral atrophy and that can kind of lead to lack of insight. So sometimes people can be, uh, or can have a body rather that is uh, low for their weight, what their weight should be and have insight. And sometimes it's the opposite where a person can have a body that is healthy for um, their genetics, but um, but have low insight. So it, it's not always the case, but typically if someone um, has a body, again, in the, the uh, low weight range for what their genetics are, then uh, they might need this outside intervention treatment. And um, it can be very uh, important to do that because it, it can be life-saving. Um, so uh, these are the two um, main categories. And if a person has moderate to high insight, then you can do individual and group therapy. So this, this can help funnel uh, patients in the, the right direction here. Um, when outside intervention is needed, what we're looking at is parents or carers of people with eating disorders plan, prepare, serve, and monitor meals and snacks, plus the time afterwards and bathroom usage. Uh, support is provided until either weight, the weight that is needed is gained or the person medically stabilizes or yeah, both of those things. Um, and until the, the person is ready to eat alone and medical monitoring needs to happen during this time for a variety of reasons. People can kind of destabilize uh, health wise during the, the refeeding process. And um, what can also be helpful are supportive skill groups and meal processing groups or, or periods after eating to kind of talk a little bit about how the, the person's feeling. Um, and those um, interventions really uh, are, um, again, in this, this uh, outside intervention category, right? And then the second um, group, so the individual therapy folks, um, what we're trying to do with this group is establish regular eating uh, patterns. So breakfast, lunch, dinner, and two snacks, um, incorporating challenged foods uh, or feared foods into uh, the person's diet, uh, we're trying to, um, foster mindfulness of hunger and fullness cues and eating in accordance to those hunger and fullness cues and exposure. And this is uh, <laughs> somewhat specific to my style of treatment, but exposure to core fears around weight gain. So for instance, if a person fears that they'll be romantically rejected, if they gain 10 pounds, maybe creating some sort of psychological exposure exercise around imagining this feared scenario and habituating to it. Um, and, and that, uh, fostering recovery. So that's more for the, the therapist on the call, that last intervention, but the other interventions here can be supported by different disciplines. Um, so not to spend too much on diet, uh, too much time on diagnoses, but just from my framework, I, I tend to think of these categories of, um, uh, kind of outside intervention and individual therapy. <laughs> as uh, the following. So um, if a person has anorexia nervosa, atypical anorexia nervosa, or ARFID, avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, these are typically the diagnoses that require outside intervention. And um, alternatively, the three diagnoses that uh, can normally be treated in individual therapy are bulimia nervosa, binge eating disorder, and OSFED, other specified feeding and eating disorder, with the exception of atypical anorexia nervosa. And briefly, for those of you who haven't heard of atypical anore anorexia nervosa or AAN, um, this, this is a uh, kind of like an unofficial diagnosis for folks that have behaviors that are very much um, in line with anorexia nervosa or anorexia nervosa, except that the person's body is not you know, considered underweight by BMI standards, but BMI is very problematic and the person is is underweight for what is healthy for them. And so they typically uh, would need to gain weight, et cetera. So um, I denote this category of OSFED uh, with the removal of atypical anorexia nervosa, because it's really anorexia nervosa um, as OSFED X. And that's just kind of like a little uh, quirk of mine that, that I find useful. Um, okay. And I'm just going to pop open the chat here in case there's any important questions. Okay. Um, oops. Okay. Sorry. Now I can't close the chat. What's going on? Um, the question <laughs> if, you, if you want, so that way you don't have to keep switching back and forth, whatever is easier for you. What was that? 
I can read the questions to you at the end if you want. I just, so you don't have to keep switching screens, whatever easier for you. Yeah. I usually like to keep the chat open. I just can't seem to like figure it out, but I'm just going to keep barreling ahead. I can't like move the chat box. I'm so sorry. Um, it's, there's like a, it, it's just kind of like the way that um, I see um, there was something covering it. Okay. There we go. So, um, so um, treatment options, the gold standard treatment option for outside intervention, typically for the diagnoses of AN, AAN, and ARFID would be family-based therapy or uh, FBT. And then the gold standard, um, and that, and by the way, FBT is typically for adolescents, but you can use it with adults. Um, and then there's CBT enhanced or CBTE, which is the gold standard treatment for adolescents or adults. Um, that should say, or adults, I'm going to add that in, or adults, um, with BN, BED, OSFED X without AAM. Okay. I'm like editing in real time. Okay. Um, and, and Chris Fairburn, who wrote CBTE says that you can use it for AN, but really that's only for folks that are super duper motivated. Uh, typically you would again, need outside intervention. So, um, a, a treatment package that I created along with Dr. Dina Hirsch is called integrative modalities therapy or IMT. And it's an evidence-based practice approach that integrates the various interventions from FBT and CBTE plus DBT and ACT and other psychological treatments into a complete package. It says it's for adolescents, but we use it for adults all the time. Um, it just kind of depends. So what an evidence-based practice model is, is it takes all of the best researched evidence out there, plus it combines that with clinical expertise and the needs of the patient. So we wrote a manual that reflects just what a, an expert clinician would do in the trenches, given the fact that people present to your office with a variety of issues that don't quite fit into these uh, highly researched protocols, and that sometimes you need to uh, kind of move along the spectrum of outside intervention. Sometimes you need more intervention uh, for somebody that, for instance, have has BN, and sometimes you need less intervention for someone that has AN. It really depends. So this, this um, a treatment that is outlined in my book, Treating Eating Disorders in Adolescence, is something that you can really use flexibly <laughs> to meet the needs of uh, patients with, with any sort of eating pathology, really. So it has three modalities. We, we have a family module, individual module, and a group module. And again, you just use it based on the patient's needs, and the book outlines all of that really specifically. So um, the other thing that... Um, is interesting about IMT is that it really takes the guesswork out of clinical work because what we found is that there, there's so much patriarchal language and language that is steeped in the thin ideal and ideas that we have about health that are steeped in thinness being healthy that are so problematic and so uh, traumatic really for people with eating disorders and people who don't have eating disorders. So what Dina and I thought would be best is to write out uh, blocks of text, almost like blog posts really, and put them in handouts for, for clinicians across disciplines to give to patients and carers that has the language that we know, um, at least you know to date when it was published in 2019, it, it's kind of like the, the, the best um, uh, least maladaptive language that we could use. Um, and so the, that, um, I think would, would kind of help, uh, the treatment interventions be administered really reliably and kind of in a foolproof way. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about it later, but I've had, um, patients, uh, uh, adolescent patients and some adult patients who come into treatment because they essentially have to be, and they don't want to talk. They don't want to engage. But all we do is we sit down and we read the handouts together and somehow they gain weight and somehow they're, they're purging steps. And so, you know, it just gives, um, it gives patients and carriers something to focus on. And it's again, kind of like foolproof. So, um, IMT was developed specifically so that people without a lot of training in eating disorders could just pick up the manual and start using it because none of us really get training in the treatment of eating disorders unless you seek it out like you all are. So IMT is, is uh, meant to, to fill that treatment need. Okay. So um, speaking of outside intervention and what that looks like, we're going to focus a lot on that here because 
outside intervention is where you see the most roadblocks coming up for practitioners, for carers, for patients. And, and so again, it will be our focus here. Um, all right, so taking a step back, <laughs> if a situation that you're watching unfold is life-threatening and the person is not aware that they're in danger, what do you do? So for instance, a toddler is about to unwittingly fall down a flight of stairs or an adult who can't swim falls into the deep end of a pool, right? What do you do? You intervene, you jump in and you help because the person is in danger, they could die and they they don't have awareness that, uh, that they are in, in danger. So a person with anorexia nervosa or an eating disorder more broadly that has low or no insight um, falls into this category. So we do need to intervene, even though I'm telling you, if you haven't intervened, it feels really icky. It feels like you're crossing boundaries. It does not feel good. You get a lot of pushback. It's not easy. But my kind of thesis here <laughs> is that the compassionate move is actually to intervene and to notice all of your emotions that are coming up that are really uncomfortable and decide to move forward with intervention anyhow. And that really is kind of a true testament to um, your compassion and your conviction to help. Now, that's not overstepping um, uh, boundaries. Uh, we want to make sure that we're not saying like a person, you know, has to do things our way necessarily, but we do need to, I think, ethically promote intervention style treatment that evidence has shown to be life-saving, right? So it's not about doing things our way or getting people to kind of like, you know, uh, do what we want. It's not a power move. It's a compassion, heart-centered move of saying, hey, listen, you know, you're you're in a dangerous situation here and you're not aware. So I need to step in. It's my duty as a professional to do so. Okay. So um there are a lot of different terms that <coughs> excuse me. We're gonna get through this. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, there are a lot of terms uh to um to go over that are really kind of integral here. So one is a term called anosognosia. So anosognosia is the eating disorder specific term for lack of insight. So in OCD, we just say the person doesn't have any insight. In eating disorders, we say they have anosognosia. I don't know why, but we do. <laughs> so that's that term. And when a person has lack of insight, again, really important uh, determining factor as to what uh, interventions to choose. Um, having an egocentonic disorder. So an egocentonic disorder, it, it, it doesn't really so clearly, um, that term doesn't so clearly describe to me as a behaviorist really what, what that means. But um, I came up with this term that maybe uh, helps explain things a little bit more clearly called a self-eclipsing eating disorder or a seed. So a self-eclipsing eating disorder is when the self is still there, the person has a consciousness or a soul or a personality or whatever you kind of uh, want to conceptualize a, a true, you know, person's true nature as, but the eating disorder comes and eclipses um, their true self. And when a person is eclipsed by their eating disorder, you are, you know, really kind of interacting with that disorder. So you can, you think that you're talking to the person, you think that they're advocating for themselves, maybe if you don't have the training, but really what's happening is you're saying, Hey, you need, need to eat. You maybe need to gain weight. And you're getting all of this, um, you know, kind of argument or pushback, but that's really the eating disorder. The, the person, um, you know, in, in their consciousness, their true self doesn't necessarily want to have the eating disorder is the framework we're working with here, but that the disorder wants to take over and is power moving. And so you can you can kind of interface with that. Now, if you've had experience treating eating disorders before, um, you might uh, you might have seen this phenomenon of of the person having their lights go out when the eating disorder takes over, so to speak. Like they're like the person is not really like in there. You can't you can't kind of get to them. And then as they recover, you see the lights come back on. Now I've heard that terminology across the world. People talk about the lights going out and the lights going back on. And, um, you know, if you haven't seen it, it's, it's really fascinating to watch and it's, it's a real phenomena. And that's because again, the, the self is eclipsed by, by the eating disorder. So, um, so things that patients can say <laughs> because they present as wanting to have the illness, even though we 
you know, or working from the framework that their true self does not want to have the illness. Um, they'll say like, I just want to lose weight. It's no big deal. I just want to lose weight. Or you can't make me gain. Like, who are you? You can't tell me what to do. Um, or I just feel better once I lose weight. It, just, it makes me feel good to exercise or I hate you or, you know, whatever else. Um, I've had patients throw things or knock my bookshelf down or throw furniture. I mean, I've seen it all. <laughs> I've had insured dumped on me, you know, the whatever. Like you see this like real, you know, um, pushback against treatment. Uh, but that's part of the eating disorder. It's just part of it. We don't say if a person dumps unsure on you, uh, like, oh, you know, they're just not motivated. So, you know, I'm just going to sit and wait until like the patient's going to feel like they want to recover because I'm not going to work harder than the patient. Well, I have news for you. If you're going to be an eating disorder specialist or you're going to treat eating disorders, you're going to probably have to work a little harder than the patient at first. It's just kind of like the way that it goes. Um, and then, you know, once the person's lights come back on, usually they'll say, like, oh, I'm so sorry. Thank you so much for sticking in there with me. And, you know, like you, you, you get the gratitude much further down the line. Uh, it's a very delayed uh, gratification type experience to be an eating disorder therapist. So you're not going to get it right away. Um, you're talking like a year or two down the line before you get a thank you. So, um, so yeah, you, you want to, again, kind of conceptualize um, this disorder as the eating disorder, not the person fighting back. Um, okay. So roadblocks that a practitioner could have. Um, so we might start to kind of believe like, oh yeah, maybe this person doesn't really need to gain weight. And like, you know, maybe they're menstruating or maybe their bone density is fine, or maybe their labs are okay. I mean, I've had adult patients who are, you know, five, five and 80 pounds and have their, their labs. Okay. Um, but you know, at any point, you know, they could kind of, um, their, their bodies can destabilize and maybe they'd have a heart attack or something. So, you know, you, you, you can't really start be an effective practitioner if you're colluding with the eating disorder. So that's, that's a big roadblock. Um, we can get conditioned by the patient and their care, the patient's eating disorder and their carers to be afraid of explosive reactions. So if we mention, okay, you have to eat more and we get, you know, we get a reaction back or we're afraid we're going to lose our patient, or maybe we won't make the money that we need for our practice. If we push too hard, right. We can really get afraid. We can get conditioned to be afraid of these reactions. Plus we might not have this, the clinical skills to manage them if you haven't been taught, because again, nobody gets training in the treatment of eating disorders. So that could be a big roadblock. Um, we believe that the person should have total autonomy no matter what, right? Oh, well, you know, the person's saying that they don't want to gain weight. And so, you know, it's a free country, so they shouldn't have to gain weight, you know, this kind of a thing. Um, sidebar on this, uh, I've done some work on indigenous reservations, including one in Minnesota with a colleague of mine who um, is Navajo. He's a clinical psychologist and his name's Dr. William Shunkamola. Amazing work. He has a whole talk on uh, the ethics code of the APA and how it is totally written from an individualist perspective. And in indigenous cultures, typically there's more of a communal perspective. And so he goes through the code of ethics one by one and explains how that actually in an indigenous population, these ethics that match the individual would be harmful to indigenous folks and their and, and the way that they operate in the world. And so I think it's really interesting to think about, um, you know, taking a communal collective approach to the treatment of eating disorders because it does take a village. I mean, you uh, you you need a lot of people on the treatment team. You need a lot of people in the home helping. And so um, to 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 kind of think less about the autonomy of the individual who has a disorder that is destructive and life threatening, and more about what can we do as a team to help this person who doesn't have the insight and who might die to to move forward into a psychological space where they actually are able to make sovereign decisions. Um, and but the sovereign decision making doesn't come until after the eating disorder has passed. So that's a really really big roadblock that we have. Uh, many of us on the call, I can't speak for everyone, of course, but I, I, for one, grew up in, you know, New York, which is kind of like the epicenter of individualist thinking. And so um, that took me personally a while to kind of get over as, as a blocker. Okay. Uh, another practitioner block that we can have is that um, we think that, oh, the, the person's body image will improve 
if they just lost a little more weight like oh yeah okay so they they you know they have poor body image but you know what like their body doesn't fit the ideal so maybe if we just let them lose a little more weight then they'll be happy no absolutely not this is like patriarchal thin ideal like really um you know really dangerous territory so we want to be careful um not to uh not to collude with the eating disorder by allowing weight loss as a way to improve body image body image is completely a psychological construct a person can be 5 5 and 80 pounds and think they're fat and have horrible body image a person can have a a, a larger frame body that doesn't fit the ideal and feel totally embodied embodied and connected uh, connected and kind of like intuitive in their body right um and integrated so so it is absolutely a fallacy that your body image is dependent on the the actual 3d shape of your body those are two totally separate constructs and it's super duper duper important here for everybody for yourself and for your your practice um okay so we kind of went through these um and just in the interest of time so it's important to work on addressing these roadblocks that that you might have about inter intervention style treatment or even within your own psychology um so this <laughs> Um, this really, uh, can be hard to understand. It, it can be hard to understand how amazingly life-changing and life-saving outside intervention is without seeing it. So even just going through the process one time, just being willing to kind of put yourself out there and help a person weight restore one time with outside intervention, you will see beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is the right way to go. And so you can feel more kind of embodied and confident uh, in that. Um, it, you know, it's okay to not trust the process. Um, I think if, 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 um, if you're just willing to give it a shot, then that's good enough. Be willing to give it a shot, see how it goes and, and then make a, an assessment as to whether outside intervention is for you or not. I thought I, I would hate it. I honestly, when I heard about what FBT was, I, I was not on board with learning it. I thought this sounds like a total nightmare. And then I realized that eating disorders are one of the deadliest mental illnesses. Depending upon the study you look at, they're either the, the number one most deadly illness or the number two most deadly mental illness. And nobody gets training in it and how to treat it. I mean, there's a huge, <laughs> huge disparity. We've seen rates pretty much double or triple since the pandemic. The severity is up. I mean, we are in like a major crisis situation. So if there was ever a time to be willing to try something new outside of your comfort zone to help treat eating disorders, now's the time. So, um, okay. So these are reasons that are acceptable and non-acceptable from my ethical framework uh, around whether or not you should use outside intervention. And so... Um, th this table is supposed to be read just kind of the left column in a silo and the right column in a silo The nothing on the same line like matches up. So, <clears throat> so acceptable reasons not to use outside intervention are as follows. The patient has really no family or supports. Um, they live in a group home without supportive staff. Um, carers really aren't available to eat with the patient because they have jobs and they, they need to work. Um, carers have active eating disorders and they're not willing to work on them. Sometimes I've treated uh, like entire families that all have eating disorders and we just kind of all work on it together. Uh, and everybody works on eating more and everybody works on eating fear food. So if the, the carers are willing to work on their own eating pathology for the sake of their child or their loved one, then great. I mean, just, just roll with it. Um, but if, if they have, if the carers have active eating disorders and, and, they want their loved one or child to continue restricting and they want to continue restricting. This is usually when you see the treatment not working or they just drop out. Um, so um, there are some other reasons here that are, are in line with that. Now, those are really the, <laughs> the only acceptable reasons not to use outside intervention. If a person needs to gain weight, they have low insight and or they're medically compromised. Um, unacceptable reasons are like, Family interventions are difficult. Like that's not good enough for me. Like if, if you're just like, oh, that these interventions are difficult. No, like, you, like it, it seems to me that it, it's important to to learn as part of your clinical practice how to do this. Um, family interventions are uncomfortable or easier to skip. Um, there's mild to moderate discord in the home. Uh, carers can't eat every single meal uh, with 
the the patients. You know, it, life is messy. And if parents or carers can only do dinners, okay, so we only do dinners, but those dinners are going to be really big and they're going to be really long. And so you, you just kind of have to, to roll with it. But I, I think it's important not to, you know, metaphorically speaking, throw the baby out with the bathwater. Like we don't, we're not looking for a hundred percent perfection. We're looking for, you know, progress in the right direction and support. Um, okay. So, all right. Um, I have a couple of handouts in the IMT uh, resource packet. So there's the book treating eating disorders in adolescence. That's the manual. And then it comes with all of these free PDFs that you can download off of New Harbinger's website. So this is a handout. It's a family handout that talks through the 10 reasons why a child will despise supervised eating. Um, so the number one reason, right, is that <laughs> the eating disorder doesn't want to gain weight. Um, the person feels anxiety, guilt, disgust, shame, regret after eating. The child could be literally nauseated by eating. It could feel like a punishment. The person could feel infantilized. They can feel embarrassed by the supervision. They could feel mistrusted. Um, they don't like being the sick one. Uh, the, you know, the, it's so time intensive. The child is just kind of like sick of being with the carer. Um, and, and, you know, everybody just wants it to be over, but at, at the same time, this is a life-saving intervention. And so all of these things are really hard and they can be addressed in therapy, but none of them is a sufficient reason to not move forward with an intervention. Um, okay. So things that you can do to help shape behavior of both the carers and the patient towards sticking to recovery rooted behaviors like eating the amount of food being served, eating the type of food being served, eating on time, et cetera, et cetera, um, are as follows. So um, I like this handout a lot in particular. And out of all of the IMT handouts, this is the one that seems to be one of the most popular ones. And people have this on inpatient units and part of like intake packets and things like this. So this handout breaks um, breaks out into two columns eating disorder behaviors that occur in the context of intervening, um, like negotiating about the type of food being served and negotiating about the amount of food being served, and then the kinds of mentality or thought that, that go with these behaviors. And then alternatively on the right-hand side, recovery behaviors uh, along with acceptance-oriented statements that we're aiming for. So the idea is that we expect that all of these behaviors on the left are going to pop up in the context of intervention-style treatment. And over time, we just want to work towards shaping the behavior to look like what's on the right-hand column. So we'll just take the first one as an example. So if you're seeing negotiating about the type of food being served as a behavior and a statement like, you know, I'm not going to eat a cheeseburger, can I have a turkey sandwich instead? What we're, we're looking to do is um, have the person eat the type of food being served and, and display the kind of attitude like this. You know, I'm afraid to eat the cheeseburger. At the same time, I'll eat it because it's going to help me recover and face my fears, right? So this is the, 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 the framework that we're working in with different behaviors. Um, and how we, we move from the left to the right is, um, well, this is debatable, but uh, what I've found personally in my clinical practice, and this is where the evidence-based practice of IMT comes in. This is not, you know, tried and true researched intervention. This is like my personal Dr. Tara Deliberto experience that I'm sharing here, um, which is um, it's it's helpful to use a variant on labeled praise. So if you're familiar with the term labeled praise, it means... Um, you know, praising a very specific behavior. So if you're you're trying to get a toddler to sit down, you could say, you know, Tommy, very good job for sitting in the blue chair. So sitting in the blue chair is the behavior. Um, and then, you know, very good job is the praise. So you're, you're praising the specific behavior that's a labeled praise. Now you don't necessarily want to get into that uh, so specifically. And so kind of like on the nose like that with people with the eating disorders, because if you're like, good job, Tommy, for eating the cheeseburger, they're going to be like, you can go do some awful things to yourself. <laughs> you know, like you're going to get like a very intensely negative reaction back because the person, you know, they're having that internal struggle that kind of like 
devil on the shoulder, angel on the shoulder struggle of, you know, should I eat it? Should I not eat it? And they're begrudgingly eating the cheeseburger because you, you know, you're kind of telling them that they have to. And then if you say good job on top of it, you know, they just kind of explode. So you need to be a little bit more, um, uh, slick <laughs> about it. So, um, I, uh, encourage giving what I call recovery specific positive attention. So, um, maybe it's subtle. Maybe the person takes a bite of the cheeseburger and you smile. Um, maybe, uh, you thank them. You could say, you could say, thank you for eating the meal that I made for you. You know, I really appreciate that. I know that was hard for you. Um, so it has a little bit of, um, a more reverent approach and it has less of an infantilizing feel. Um, and my, <laughs> my experience is that that using recovery specific positive attention is a really good way to shift um, behaviors from being on the left to being on the right of this table. Okay. okay. So these are all examples of uh, recovery specific positive attention or RECSPA uh, for short. Okay. Care skills. So um, yeah, you can find all of these handouts at this URL here. Um, these are a list of uh, habits that, <coughs> excuse me, carers can engage in uh, that are unhelpful during the refeeding process. And these are roadblocks to, to really work on and overcome. But it, it kind of just encapsulates uh, what we don't want to do. And then uh, the next handout will be what we do want to do. And so you're probably sensing a pattern that I like things very organized in terms of what we don't do and we, what we do do. And the, the whole manual is kind of set up this way. Okay. So the things that we want to avoid and that we want carers to be aware of that they're doing are escalating, disagreeing with the other carer uh, or not coordinating, wavering on the rules, saying like, oh, you need to eat this. Oh, okay. Well, maybe you don't. Like, I just kind of want to get on with my day. Like, no, it's just, this is what you're eating and that's it. Um, showing impatience or frustration, nagging, like, oh, come on, like, please, like, just eat it. You know, we want to avoid that. Or sarcasm, like, oh, great job. Yeah, you took a bite, like, fantastic. Like, let's throw a parade, right? Like, we want to avoid all of that. This is more of a detailed look. And what we want to do instead are employ what we call the table skills. So together eating, so it's, you know, eating together, appreciating the struggle, so validating, breaking it down and being positive. So you can say like, great job taking, you know, that first bite. And you can also eat with the person. So I like to eat the same exact meal that the person with the eating disorder has. So uh, I opened and directed um, New York Presbyterian's eating disorder partial hospitalization program. Uh, and during that time, I ate <laughs> breakfast, lunch, and snack Monday through Friday with the patients for many years. And um, so if I knew that there were there was a particular patient that was struggling with a particular challenge, me like a cheeseburger, I would get that same meal for lunch. And I would say like, okay, I'm gonna take a bite and then you take a bite. And we would just kind of work through it like that. Okay, so we're gonna be headed into the Q&A soon. Good, okay, I'm almost done. <laughs> How many minutes do I have left? Three? Uh, three, just 645. But if you need just a few minutes longer, we can go over a little bit. That's all right. I'm I'm rounding up. Okay. So um, and this is a, a more detailed look at how to employ the table skills. Um, and uh just before we wrap, um, I wanted to add that in individual therapy, you can see some resistance as well. Um, but it's the same kind of thing, you know, using reinforcement, um, using the table skills, eating with the person. You know, another thing that is really helpful, if you have overcome your own eating struggles, I think a, a really powerful, short self-disclosure about how, you know, maybe you struggled and this was really hard for you and now you feel really free, that can help a person feel um, validated and that, you know, you're just not trying to get them fat, but like you've been there, you know, get them fat is, is something that you hear quite a lot. Like you're just trying to, you know, fatten me up and, you know, that kind of thing. And so if you, if you um, kind of discreetly and, you know, mindfully self-disclose, that can go a really long way um, with both carers and patients. If you have any uh, experience in higher levels of care, with refeeding. Um, so for instance, like I, I have experience 
eating in hospital settings with patients. And I can relate to parents in that way and say, Hey, listen, you know, like I, I struggled as a practitioner doing this. So I tell a story like the very first time I was in charge of uh, monitoring a meal, uh, <laughs> like an hour later, all of this milk poured out of the bottom of one of the plants in the room. And one of the staff members was like, who was doing breakfast? Like the patients poured all their milk in the plant. There's milk all over the floor. It's like, ah. you know, so like my very first meal was like a total disaster and I got in trouble and, you know, and now like I've written this book and like I do this professionally and, you know, so like it just, it can go a long way uh, to just have, you know, a little humility about, um, your own experience with this and how hard it is and whatever, you know, whatever personal experience you have to share, uh, could go a really long way and just like really, uh, you know, knocking down resistance. So, okay. So these are the two references of gold standard treatments. So on the left for adolescents without insight, needing to gain weight, we have the FBT treatment manual on the right for adults and adolescents, um, with insight, not needing to gain weight, we have CBTE. Um, this is my book that really kind of addresses, you know, all of it and it integrates all of it. Um, you can get it on Amazon. I like the Kindle version just because I like to search within it and there's a lot to go through. Um, and then uh, you could download all the handouts here. There's a family module, the group module, the individual module, and um you can sign up for, I think all you have to do is sign up for the newsletter. You get all this stuff for free. And if you have any questions or comments, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. I, I love to hear from, from folks who have questions about how to implement the material. I'm, I'm more than happy to answer them. I also have a Facebook group uh, called, uh, I think it's like IMT, uh, like clinicians who want to learn. It's like a closed group and you can always message me through there. Um, and also I, so this is a little bit outdated, but I hold a, a free consultation hour. So if anyone in the English speaking world or not uh, has a consultation question, uh, what I do is um, if there are multiple people that week, I say, okay, um, this is the hour that I am, I have my open office hour, anybody can come. So if you want, um, please reach out. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to consult. Uh, we need people like you that are willing to learn how to treat eating disorders and we need support. And so I'm, I'm willing to volunteer my time for that. So please reach out and that's it. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, I'm going to open the floor up now for questions or comments. Remember, there's no such thing as a dumb question. Um, you can raise your hand and unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question. Um, you can also type them in the chat. And I'm going to go ahead and start reading some from the chat. Can so I jump a lot? Can yeah. I jump ahead and, and address? Sure. One? Okay. So I want to address the question about group therapy and it being contraindicated. Great, 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 great question. So, right. So uh, when I was getting uh, trained in how to be a therapist, we spent all of 15 minutes talking about eating disorders in like the, like eight years it took me to get my PhD. And like the only thing that was taught in those 15 minutes were people don't recover from eating disorders and don't do group therapy because everybody will share, you know, tactics. And like, that was it. Like that was like the extent of my training. And both of those things are wrong. Like you can absolutely recover from eating disorders. And sometimes group is the only way to treat eating just sort of because you have to use a program um, setting in, in order to, to get everybody's needs addressed. So there are ways that I, um, I would run a group specifically to mitigate any damage and sharing of eating disorder uh, kind of techniques. I outline them all in my book and the, the manual in the group section. Um, and so, yeah, there are certain people that can disrupt or there are certain pathologies that can disrupt a group. But, but my experience has been that groups can be absolutely life-changing for people with eating disorders. Um, people can end up being supportive of one another's recovery. It's all about how it's facilitated and how the, the facilitator uh, really uh, make sure to kind of shut down any eating disorder behaviors that are happening in real time and then also outside of session. So there needs to be really clear group rules and really clear behavioral expectations about what happened in those groups. But yes, group is not contraindicated. It's, it's, I would only say um, non-skillful implementation of group is contraindicated. 
Um, okay, sorry, I wanted to really address that one, but go oh, ahead okay. and ask some other questions for me. All right. So one of our first questions is just curious on your thoughts on using IFS internal family systems for certain EDs. Great question. Um, okay. <laughs> Full disclosure, I have been meaning to learn more about IFS for a really long time. I am not an IFS specialist. I wrote IMT before IFS was like really popular. Um, I, I'm my kind of on my to-do list is learning about it. I have like 36 CE credits that I need to take myself. And like most of them, I want to be on IFS and like figuring out that question. So I will get back to you maybe in like a year, loop back around and we'll, we'll do a consultation on it. Okay. All right. I'm going to loop kind of two questions together. One I got in a direct message and one that's on here. So how can we get family members engaged in FBT modalities when they truly believe that they will make it worse and refuse to participate? And also if family members just really don't want to participate or maybe also have some eating disorder behaviors themselves. Another great question. Um, one thing that I really, really uh, love as a resource out there is FEAST, F-E-A-S-T. And it's a group of uh, carers that have been through it. I mean, these are battle-tested carers that have weight restore their kids, et cetera. And they are typically as a group more than willing to hop on a phone call and talk to a parent or a patient um, that is on the fence about FBT and kind of tell their story. I think that, yeah, using Feast as a resource or other parents who have gone through it is probably one of the best ways to, to uh, kind of circumvent the particular issue about resistance. If parents have their own or carers have their own EDs, again, if they're willing to work on their own pathology, it works great. I'm, I'm working with um, um, yeah. <laughs> a family where the mom has an ED as well as uh, uh, both children. And so we're just doing a whole, like everybody's weight restoring, everybody's eating, every like we're just, it, it's like family FBT therapy for everybody. Um, so, you know, if you, you have a carer that's willing to do that, it's not an issue. If, um, if they, if there's pathology that, <laughs> that really interferes with the implementation of treatment, then, okay, this is what I do off the record, but on the record, cause it's recorded is that I go straight to, um, uh, imaginal exposure, uh, techniques. So Sherry Levinson, who's at the university of Louisville, she's amazing. And like myself, she was trained in OCD and uh, as a behaviorist before coming into eating disorder treatment training. So we both kind of came to eating disorders thinking the same thing, which is why isn't anybody doing like actual exposure? You're doing food exposures, but people aren't afraid of food. They're afraid of what's going to happen if they gain weight when they eat food. So that's multiple treatment targets out from like the actual issue. So the, we're looking at food because we need to make sure the person's eating because they're, they're physically unwell, but what they're afraid of is gaining weight and why they're afraid of gaining weight is the bullseye. And that bullseye could be person's afraid of abandonment. They're afraid of rejection. They're, they've been bullied. They've had trauma. I mean, it's different. That bullseye is different for every person, but you can do your job as a clinician, especially the therapist on the call and figuring out what that core fear is and then how to construct an exposure around that. So I have, when, when the pandemic hit and there were, were no places for uh, eating disorder patients to go to inpatient, I took on in my private practice quite a lot of people who have bodies that are in the underweight range for, for their bodies, uh, who should be in higher levels of care, quite frankly, but there was no place to send them. And who else, if not me, is going to treat them, right? Like, well, like, oh, I would be the, like the first person that would, would be able to treat somebody outpatient, right? So what I did for those folks who didn't have family supports is just like, imaginal exposure after imaginal exposure after imaginal exposure, just like maybe multiple exposures in a session. And what that would look like is writing a little story. I go to the doctor, I step on the scale, I've gained 10 pounds. I go home, my boyfriend dumps me and just over, 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 just like, so the person gets desensitized to whatever that fear is. And every single one of my patients who was in individual therapy that should have been in a higher level of care gain weight with that. So that I think, I, I think, I think imaginal exposure is the single most powerful eating disorder intervention for, for people who are willing to do it. 
and Sherry's work is showing them. Um, she's published some research on it. So, so I had theorized about this at a conference with her like 10 years ago. And she was like, yeah, like that sounds really good. And so I just started doing it clinically. She started doing research on it and she's, she's found really positive effects with it that, and I know there's some MDs and NPs on the call. Uh, I should mention that olanzapine as a medication is not, it, it may be not something that you're aware of, but actually is the gold standard medication for people who are underweight. And my old mentor and boss, Evelyn Atia, who runs all of Columbia University's Psychiatric Institute and Cornell's Eating Disorder Unit, she ran a, a drug trial on olanzapine. And especially for patients who have this kind of obsessive thinking style, like more of an OCD type presentation, uh, olanzapine really helps with, with some of those uh, obsessive thoughts and it helps people gain weight. So that's a, medi a medication intervention that you might not be aware of as well that can help. So the combination of olanzapine and imaginal exposure is something that you can do to treat patients who need to gain weight that don't have family support. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, we have another question about um, supplements. What's your view on supplements and recovery if a person isn't able to complete a meal? And we had a good note from a hub team member that they found that also personally really helpful to meet goals without feeling so uncomfortable during refeeding. Yeah, I'm totally for it. You know, I think by supplementation, uh, you might be referring to uh, shakes like Ensure, et cetera. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's great. I think that, you know, use Ensure when you can. Um, there are different ways you can do it. So for instance, if a person isn't finishing a meal on time, you could say, all right, you just have to like chug this and shore and then we'll be done. Uh, I've honestly, I've weight restored patients for the most part with like just ensure if, um, or just peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Like you don't have to be a perfectionist. I always say Rome wasn't built in a day. Like you just need to hit the ground running, get the calories in. And, you know, <laughs> you could start incorporating challenge foods in later. The number one goal is to decrease food restriction and get calories up. Like we just need calories in. That's what we need. Um, food in, energy in. And then we can start getting to, again, like different challenge foods. Like clinicians can get stuck with saying like, oh, like, well, this person like tried a scary food and they took like a bite of pizza. And so like that, that's a win. No, we need volume. Like when a person needs to gain weight, it, it's volume. And whether it's Ensure or, you know, 18 peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, like whatever, like you just get started and then, and then you can kind of figure things out from there. That, that's the approach that I take. Great. Um, is IMT better for an active ED or used throughout the treatment of ED from the beginning to quote unquote, the end of the ED? It, IMT is for the whole shebang, I, like the whole the whole treatment. It could be used in inpatient, it could be used outpatient, it could be used in any setting. Um, there are something like 400 pages of handouts, and they're they're meant to be used in this a la carte fashion. So whatever the patient needs, you know, you if you're familiar with the various handouts, you can hand them out. Um, you know, at any point along the treatment process, if you use all the handouts, it's probably like two years worth of material. So it'll take you from like start to finish really. Great. Okay. And this will be our last one. Um, this is from Dr. Evans. How do you support the caregivers who are simply exhausted? She's had many patients who have been through higher level of care multiple times and caregivers have been living through intensive treatment processes with teens or emerging adults for many years. They want recovery, but are losing steam. Do you have any recommendations for continued ongoing caregiver motivation? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it's it's something I'm thinking about uh, with a family I'm working with now who fits that description. So um, <laughs> if they're able to, if they have the resources, time and money wise, their own individual therapy can be really helpful. Support groups, getting involved with feast, reading books like Brave Girl Eating, you know, th this kind of thing can be helpful. Um, you know, talking about self care kind of falls flat uh, a lot of the times when you're you're talking with folks that really have been through the ringer. Um, and and. Um, I, I like this idea of encouraging families to take like mini, mini breaks or mini vacations, like going like a, having a carer take a break for a weekend to go away and then kind of sub out if there are multiple carers. But, you know, it, there really isn't a good answer to that question, to be honest, you know, back 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, a person with anorexia nervosa would get admitted to 
the hospital and stay there for months and months and months and would weight restore and they would, you know, fully gain weight and be discharged. And the, there wasn't this burden on the carers in the way that we have today, but an inpatient day, <laughs> From what I remember is like four thousand dollars one day, four thousand dollars. You're not gonna you're not gonna get someone, you know, in at eighty pounds and out at one hundred and twenty pounds. Like that, the cost of that is astronomical, and so we just don't have this inpatient model any longer. And so the burden is completely, you know, on whatever the the patient's family or friends are willing and able to do. Uh, it's really, um, it's really deeply inadequate. So people are getting discharged from inpatient units at like BMI of like 16.7, for instance, again, we don't like to use BMI, but, but it's just to say that they're woefully underweight still, the bodies are woefully underweight when they're discharged from, from inpatient. And so, yeah, it, it, there's just not a good answer to this question. Unfortunately, there are little things you can do. There are little band-aids, but, but there's a huge systemic issue, um, that needs to be solved to answer that question question for real. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for wonderful questions and really good dialogue. And thank you for those answers. Um, I'm going to pass it over now to Dr. Yolanda Evans to introduce our case presentation.